Apollo 13 was the seventh crewed mission in the Apollo space program and the third meant to land on the moon. The craft was launched from Kennedy Space Center on April 11, 1970, but the lunar landing was aborted after an oxygen tank in the service module failed two days into the mission. The crew instead looped around the moon, and returned safely to Earth on April 17. The mission was commanded by Jim Lovell with Jack Swigert as command module pilot and Fred Hayes as lunar module pilot. A routine stir of an oxygen tank ignited damaged wire insulation inside it, causing an explosion that vented the contents of both of the service module oxygen tanks to space. Without oxygen, needed for breathing and for generating electric power, the service module propulsion and life support systems could not operate. The command module systems had to be shut down to conserve its remaining resources for re-entry, forcing the crew to transfer to the lunar module as a lifeboat. With the lunar landing cancelled, mission controllers worked to bring the crew home alive. Although the lunar module was designed to support two men on the lunar surface for two days, mission control in Houston improvised new procedures so it could support three men for four days. The crew experienced great hardship caused by limited power, a chilly and wet cabin and a shortage of potable water. There was a critical need to adapt the command module cartridges for the carbon dioxide removal system to work in the lunar module, the crew and mission controllers were successful in improvising a solution. In 1961, US President John F. Kennedy challenged his nation to land an astronaut on the moon by the end of the decade, with a safe return to Earth. NASA worked towards this goal incrementally, sending astronauts into space during Project Mercury and Project Gemini, leading up to the Apollo program. The goal was achieved with Apollo 11, which landed on the moon on July 20, 1969. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the lunar surface while Michael Collins orbited the moon in command module Columbia. The mission returned to Earth on July 24, 1969, fulfilling Kennedy's challenge. NASA had contracted for 15 Saturn V rockets to achieve the goal, at the time no one knew how many missions this would require. Since success was obtained in 1969 with the sixth Saturn V on Apollo 11, nine rockets remained available for a hoped for total of 10 landings. After the excitement of Apollo 11, the general public grew apathetic towards the space program and Congress continued to cut NASA's budget, Apollo 20 was cancelled. Despite the successful lunar landing, the missions were considered so risky that astronauts could not afford life insurance to provide for their families if they died in space. Even before the first U.S. astronaut entered space in 1961, planning for a centralized facility to communicate with the spacecraft and monitor its performance had begun, for the most part the brainchild of Christopher C. Kraft, who became NASA's first flight director. During John Glenn's Mercury Friendship 7 flight in February 1962, the first crewed orbital flight by the U.S., Kraft was overruled by NASA managers. He was vindicated by post-mission analysis, and implemented a rule that during the mission, the flight director's word was absolute to overrule him, NASA would have to fire him on the spot. Flight directors during Apollo had a one-sentence job description, the flight director may take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. In 1965, Houston's Mission Control Center opened, in part designed by Kraft and now named for him. In mission control, each flight controller, as well as monitoring telemetry from the spacecraft, was in communication via voice loop to specialists in a staff support room, or back room, who focused on specific spacecraft systems. Apollo 13 was to be the second H mission, meant to demonstrate precision lunar landings and explore specific sites on the moon. With Kennedy's goal accomplished by Apollo 11, and Apollo demonstrating that the astronauts could perform a precision landing, mission planners were able to focus on more than just landing safely and having astronauts minimally trained in geology gather lunar samples to take home to Earth. There was a greater role for science on Apollo 13, especially for geology, something emphasized by the mission's motto, ex luna, scientia, from the moon, knowledge. Apollo 13's mission commander, Jim Lovell, was 42 years old at the time of the spaceflight, which was his fourth and last. He was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and had been a naval aviator and test pilot before being selected for the second group of astronauts in 1962. He flew with Frank Borman in Gemini 7 in 1965 and Aldrin in Gemini 12 the following year before flying in Apollo 8 in 1968, the first spacecraft to orbit the moon. At the time of Apollo 13, Lovell was the NASA astronaut with the most time in space, with 572 hours over the three missions. 
Jack Swigert, the command module pilot, was 38 years old and held a bachelor in mechanical engineering and a master in aerospace science, he had served in the Air Force and in state Air National Guards, and was an engineering test pilot before being selected for the fifth group of astronauts in 1966. Fred Hayes, the lunar module pilot, was 35 years old. He held a Bachelor in Aeronautical Engineering, had been a Marine Corps fighter pilot, and was a civilian research pilot for NASA when he was selected as a Group 5 astronaut. Apollo 13 was Swigert's and Hayes's only spaceflight. According to the standard Apollo crew rotation, the prime crew for Apollo 13 would have been the backup crew for Apollo 10 with Mercury and Gemini veteran Gordon Cooper in command, Don F. Isiel as Command Module Pilot and Edgar Mitchell as Lunar Module Pilot. Deke Slayton, NASA's Director of Flight Crew Operations, never intended to rotate Cooper and Isiel to a prime crew assignment, as both were out of favor. He assigned them to the backup crew because no other veteran astronauts were available. Slayton's original choices for Apollo 13 were Alan Shepard as Commander, Stuart Rooser as CMP, and Mitchell as LMP. However, management felt Shepard needed more training time, as he had only recently resumed active status after surgery for an inner ear disorder, and had not flown since 1961. Swigert was originally command module pilot of Apollo 13's backup crew, with John Young as commander and Charles Duke as lunar module pilot. Seven days before launch, Duke contracted rubella from a friend of his son. This exposed both the prime and backup crews, who trained together. Of the five, only Mattingly was not immune through prior exposure. Normally, if any member of the prime crew had to be grounded, the remaining crew would be replaced as well, and the backup crew substituted, but Duke's illness ruled this out, so two days before launch, Mattingly was replaced by Swigert. Mattingly never developed rubella and later flew on Apollo 16. For Apollo, a third crew of astronauts, known as the support crew, was designated in addition to the prime and backup crews used on projects Mercury and Gemini. Slayton created the support crews because James McDivitt, who would command Apollo 9, believed that, with preparation going on in facilities across the U.S., meetings that needed a member of the flight crew would be missed. Support crew members were to assist as directed by the mission commander. Usually low in seniority, they assembled the mission's rules, flight plan, and checklists, and kept them updated. For Apollo 13, they were Vance D. Brand, Jack Lausmer and either William R. Pogue or Joseph Kerwin. For Apollo 13, flight directors were Gene Kranz, White Team, the lead flight director, Glyn Lunny, Black Team, Milt Windler, Maroon Team and Jerry Griffin, Gold Team. The CAPCOMs, the person in mission control, during the Apollo program an astronaut, who was responsible for voice communications with the crew, for Apollo 13 were Kerwin, Brand, Lausmer, Young and Mattingly. The Apollo 13 mission insignia depicts the Greek god of the sun, Apollo, with three horses pulling his chariot across the face of the moon, and the earth seen in the distance. This is meant to symbolize the Apollo flights bringing the light of knowledge to all people. The mission motto, Ex Luna, Scientia, from the moon, knowledge, appears. In choosing it, Lovell adapted the motto of his alma mater, the Naval Academy, Ex Scientia, Tridens, from knowledge, sea power. On the patch, the mission number appeared in Roman numerals as Apollo 13. It did not have to be modified after Mattingly's replacement by Swigert since it is one of only two Apollo mission insignia, the other being Apollo 11, not to include the names of the crew. The Saturn V rocket used to carry Apollo 13 to the moon was numbered SA-508, and was almost identical to those used on Apollo 8 through 12. Including the spacecraft, the rocket weighed in at 2,949,136 kg, 6,501,733 pounds. The SIC stages engines were rated to generate 440,000 newtons, 100,000 lbf, less total thrust than Apollo 12s, though they remained within specifications. Extra propellant was carried as a test since future J missions to the moon would require more propellant for their heavier payloads. This made the vehicle the heaviest yet flown by NASA and Apollo 13 was visibly slower to clear the launch tower than earlier missions. The Apollo 13 spacecraft consisted of Command Module 109 and Service Module 109, together CSM-109, called Odyssey, and Lunar Module 7, LM-7, called Aquarius. Also considered part of the spacecraft were the launch escape system which would propel the command module to safety in the event of a problem during liftoff, and the spacecraft lunar module adapter, numbered as SLA-16, which housed the lunar module during the first hours of the mission. Apollo 13's primary mission objectives were to perform selenological inspection, survey, and sampling of materials in a pre-selected region of the Fra Mauro formation. 
Deploy and activate an Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. Develop man's capability to work in the lunar environment. Obtain photographs of candidate exploration sites. The astronauts were also to accomplish other photographic objectives, including of the Gegenschein from lunar orbit, and of the Moon itself on the journey back to Earth. Some of this photography was to be performed by Swigert as Lovell and Hayes walked on the Moon. Swigert was also to take photographs of the Lagrangian points of the Earth-Moon system. Apollo 13 had 12 cameras on board, including those for television and moving pictures. The crew was also to downlink the static radar observations of the Moon. None of these was attempted because of the accident. Approximately six and a half minutes after the TV broadcast, approaching 56 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds Apollo 13 was about 180,000 nautical miles, 210,000 miles or 330,000 kilometers from Earth. Hayes was completing the shutdown of the lunar module after testing its systems while Lovell stowed the TV camera. The pressure sensor in one of the service module oxygen tanks had earlier appeared to be malfunctioning, so Liebergott, the one in charge of monitoring the CSM's electrical system requested that the stirring fans in the tanks be activated. Normally this was done once daily, this additional stir would destratify the contents of the tanks, making the pressure readings more accurate. The flight director, Kranz, had Liebergott wait a few minutes for the crew to settle down after the telecast, then Lausma relayed the request to Swigert, who activated the switches controlling the fans, and after a few seconds turned them off again. 95 seconds after Swigert activated those switches, the astronauts heard a pretty large bang, accompanied by fluctuations in electrical power and the firing of the attitude control thrusters. Communications and telemetry to Earth were lost for 1.8 seconds, until the system automatically corrected. The accident happened at 55 hours 54 minutes and 53 seconds, Swigert reported 26 seconds later, OK, Houston, we've had a problem here, echoed at 55 hours 55 minutes and 42 seconds by Lovell, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B-bus undervolt. Swigert initially thought that a meteoroid might have struck the lunar module, but he and Lovell quickly realized there was no leak. In the minutes after the accident, there were several unusual readings, showing that Tank 2 was empty and Tank 1's pressure slowly falling, that the computer on the spacecraft had reset, and that the high-gain antenna was not working. Liebergott initially missed the worrying signs from Tank 2 following the stir, as he was focusing on Tank 1, believing that its reading would be a good guide to what was present in Tank 2, so did controllers supporting him in the back room. When Kranz questioned Liebergott on this he initially responded that there might be false readings due to an instrumentation problem, Lovell, looking out the window, reported, a gas of some sort, venting into space, making it clear that there was a serious problem. Since the fuel cells needed oxygen to operate, when oxygen tank 1 ran dry, the remaining fuel cell would shut down, meaning the command condulé only significant sources of power and oxygen would be the command module batteries and its oxygen surge tank. These would be needed for the final hours of the mission, but the remaining fuel cell, already starved for oxygen, was drawing from the surge tank. Kranz ordered the surge tank isolated, saving its oxygen, but this meant that the remaining fuel cell would die within two hours, as the oxygen in tank 1 was consumed or leaked away. The volume surrounding the spacecraft was filled with myriad small bits of debris from the accident, complicating any efforts to use the stars for navigation. The mission's goal became simply getting the astronauts back to Earth alive. The lunar module had charged batteries and full oxygen tanks for use on the lunar surface, so Kranz directed that the astronauts power up and use it as a lifeboat, a scenario anticipated but considered unlikely. Procedures for using the lunar module in this way had been developed by flight controllers after a training simulation for Apollo 10 in which the module was needed for survival, but could not be powered up in time. Had Apollo 13's accident occurred on the return voyage, with the lunar module already jettisoned, the astronauts would have died. A key decision was the choice of return path. A direct abort would use the service module main engine, the service propulsion system or SPS, to return before reaching the moon. Instead, at 61 hours 29 minutes and 43 seconds.49 the choose to thrust the descent propulsion system and that move took Apollo 13 back to a free return trajectory. The change would get Apollo 13 back to Earth in about four days time, though with splashdown in the Indian Ocean, where NASA had few recovery forces. The lunar module carried enough oxygen, but that still left the problem of removing carbon dioxide, which was absorbed by canisters of lithium hydroxide pellets. The lunar module's stock of canisters, meant to accommodate two astronauts for 45 hours on the moon, was not enough to support three astronauts for the return journey to Earth. 
The command module had enough canisters, but they were the wrong shape and size to work in the lunar module equipment. Engineers on the ground devised a way to bridge the gap, using plastic, covers ripped from procedures manuals, duct tape, and other items, NASA engineers referred to the improvised device as the mailbox. Despite the accuracy of the transurf injection, the spacecraft slowly drifted off course, necessitating a correction. As the lunar module guidance system had been shut down following the PC plus 2 burn, the crew was told to use the line between night and day on the Earth to guide them, a technique used on NASA's Earth orbit missions but never on the way back from the Moon. Ionization of the air around the command module during re-entry caused a four-minute communications blackout. Apollo 13's shallow re-entry path lengthened this to six minutes, longer than had been expected. Odyssey regained radio contact and splashed down safely in the South Pacific Ocean, southeast of American Samoa and 6.5 kilometers nautical miles from the recovery ship, USS Iwo Jima. Although fatigued, the crew was in good condition except for Hayes, who was suffering from a serious urinary tract infection because of insufficient water intake. The crew stayed overnight on the ship and flew to Pago Pago, Samoa, the next day. They flew to Hawaii, where President Richard Nixon awarded them the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor. They stayed overnight, and then were flown back to Houston.